we've all waited for this moment, the entire conference. I'm not talking about my talk. This is, uh, this is not what we've been waiting for. We've been waiting for the poster awards. Um, drum roll. Um, we will announce it at lunch. We're still missing, uh, I think, the last uh, stuff. It's on. It's, they, we will we'll be there before lunch, okay? Then we, get the, we will announce the, the winners um, of the post awards. And with that, I'm just going to give the stage to you. All right. Thank you, Morton. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to kick off this day by presenting Morton, who probably nobody here knows. Uh, so I will be chairing um, the first session of the day. Uh, because Morton is presenting, but I also must say that uh, may, may, we need to do a deep bow and say thank you to Morton and Daniela Bakula uh, for putting this all together. <laughs> so Morton heads the laboratory uh, of uh, aging biology at the Center of Healthy Aging here at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, his lab is predominantly focused on uh, interventions uh, in aging and focusing predominantly on DNA damage, DNA repair, and also the many diseases that resemble a aging. So he collaborates, I think, with pretty much, I don't know, maybe with half of the people in this room, <laughs> uh, and is a prolific uh, scientist. Uh, we first met at the National Institute of Aging in the US when he was uh, doing his uh, research work there. Uh, and then he moved to the University of Copenhagen, and suddenly it exploded. So actually, Michael Petter in his lab uh, was an intern at Encilico, so we, when we were in Baltimore. And it's a great privilege for me to present Morton, uh, who is going to talk about interventions and aging uh, in the context of DNA damage, DNA repair. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see if I can get my slides up here. Um, all right. So. Um, Thank you so much for uh, joining. Uh, so my lab focuses on uh, trying to understand the molecular basis of phenotypes that occur with aging. So um, why do we uh, develop uh, wrinkles? Why do we get graying of hair? Why do we get pigmentation changes in the skin? And um, why do we get fat redistributions? And why, why do we die? So uh, that's the focus of the lab. So there are uh, obviously uh, more phenotypes than what you can see on the surface. So these are phenotypes. Um, this is basically we downloaded PubMed and then we looked for uh, phenotypes associated with aging. And so the, I've, I've shown this many times and I tell the same joke every time and I'll, I'll say it again, don't worry. So uh, graying of hair is the most prevalent feature. 99% of everybody will develop graying of hair. The 1% that does not develop graying of hair are the ones that are completely bald. Um, uh, muscle weakness is highly prevalent and there are other features. Um, uh, cancer, for example, there's a lifetime prevalence of around 40% of everybody will develop some type of cancer. That's roughly half the room here. This is kind of crazy, right? Um, and dementia will maybe between 10 and 20% of everybody will develop some sort of dementia. So obviously we want to do something about this. So as Alex mentioned, we, we focus a lot on, um, on diseases of premature aging. So diseases where children grow old very rapidly. And many of them, or most of them, are probably caused by defects in DNA repair. So when I was a postdoc in Will Bohr's lab, um, we came up with um, some models for why you might see accelerated aging, probably driven by a hyperactivation of the DNA damage response, which is also what uh, Fabrizio said yesterday. So I was very happy that that uh, that you mentioned that. Um, and uh, one aspect of the DNA damage response is driven by this enzyme called PARP1. And when you get hyperactivation of PARP1, you lose uh, NAD. And then that leads to metabolic changes. And so you can intervene by using, for example, a PARP inhibitor, and then that extends the lifespan. This is a nematode. Uh, you can also um, rescue the, the uh, transcription of changes in the brain by giving an NAD precursor that increases NAD. 
And you can also go downstream and maybe attempt to impact a seal coa. I'll get back to that in a second. I'll just show you something a little bit about the uh, NR aspect. And we just got this data actually, uh, I think I got it two days ago from Christopher Norheim, who's been running a clinical trial using NR in uh, COPD patients. Um, and so this is a double blinded placebo controlled trial where we treated COPD patients with NR. The primary outcome measure was IL-6, uh, IL-8, I mean. And so we see that we do get an increase in NAD in the patients. Uh, and this seems to be associated with a decrease in IL-8. So the blinding was just removed, so I don't have any more data, unfortunately. But I, I feel like this was really cool. Uh, so I wanted to show this. So going back to the molecular stuff. So when you get hyperactivation of PARP1, you lose NAD. And when you lose NAD, this decrease, this changes the pyruvate to lactate ratio and you get more lactate production. So when you age, you actually get a little bit more lactate in the brain and other tissues and in premature aging diseases, we see more lactate being produced. That means that glucose is shunted to lactate and you therefore get less pyruvate and maybe less acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is important not only for energy metabolism, but also for, uh, as a molecule, to synthesize different things, for example, myelin in the brain. So with age, you lose myelin, and in premature aging diseases, you often see a loss of myelination in the brain. Acetyl-CoA is also important for acetylation reactions uh, that we um, uh, also, that Eric Burden also mentioned uh, um, yesterday or the day before. Um, so acetyl-CoA can also be uh, generated through ketones or, for example, or also through citrate. So we wanted to test this relationship. Uh, this is work done by Michael Peter. This is an old photo when he had long hair. Now he looks much more like a businessman. Um, and uh, so we wanted to test this. This was done in collaboration with uh, Rafa. Um, and so we generated, we had CSB knockout models. And we then crossed those models with models that lost citrate. So we limited the amount of acetyl-CoA being available. And then we could titrate back with ketones to see if we could rescue features. So we would, we would uh, think that loss of INTI would exacerbate phenotypes in cocaine syndrome models. Uh, and so actually if we started out, as, and so if we go back a little bit, so Indy is interesting also in the lifespan context because this was first uh, discovered by Stephen Helfen that when you knock out Indy, which stands for I'm not dead yet, in flies, and, and they become, um, if they are uh, heparin sufficient, if they are heterozygotes, then they actually live longer. Um, so this this was why we also wanted to look at it in the fly. And so we've, we first wanted to identify a CSB homolog. So this is this gene that's mutated in premature aging disease cocking syndrome. Um, and we then clustered with other uh, enzymes that are in the same family, so SWISNF enzymes in Drosophila, and found a cl close relationship with HEL89B. And so we, one of the hallmarks of Cochrane syndrome is that they're UV sensitive. And so the, the larvae, if you have uh, fly larvae and you irradiate them with UV radiation, they're also more sensitive than the, uh, than the controls. And interestingly, if you give them ketones, so replenish the acetyl-CoA, you rescue some of those features. Um, and so, we wanted to test this relationship, but because there are many genetic components and a lot of, um, a lot of variants, so we had 20 genotypes, and then we wanted to test, Michael wanted to test three interventions and a control, so suddenly we had 80, 80 treatment groups, and for lifespan studies, you know, you, then you, I was start getting sweaty. Um, but uh, Michael is a biomedical engineer. He just said, that's an engineering issue. There's no, this is easy, let's do this. And so he, uh, he came up with, uh, he actually built uh, machines. And he built a, a machine which can track flies over time. So there's a deep neural network that can detect flies in this video feed in the fly cam. And, uh, and then we can track them over time. Um, and this 
has led to the formation of this company track bio where we're tracking things a very creative name um, but that meant that we could then test uh, a lot of these interventions and so here are a sort of uh, heat maps of lifespan curves uh, we do see a slight effect on beta hydroxybutyrate in some genotypes I think what's very interesting is that the NDCSB so if you knock out ND completely or knock it down completely then it phenocopies actually the cocaine syndrome features you also have motor function and, and you see the same uh, changes so this was uh, quite interesting and there's a little bit of rescue with beta hydroxybutyrate so what about mammals so we also this is together with Rafa de Capo we generated cocaine syndrome indies so double knockouts and here we also see that there's a somewhat overlap in the transcriptomics of of um, of the cocaine syndrome mice and the indie mice um, um, one aspect is that in the cocaine syndrome and double knockout you have a neuroinflammatory phenotype and that is completely reversed with a ketogenic diet and actually the Indy knockouts uh, there are also benefiting hugely by a ketogenic diet there's almost no difference in the transcriptomics and so humans that have Indy mutations also actually develop a neurodegenerative phenotype so they don't live longer they develop a, an early onset uh, epilepsy phenotype that's actually a little bit resembling some of the features we see in cocaine syndrome and the ketogenic diet seems to rescue it and what was really striking so when we do um, untargeted metabolomics in the in the cerebellum then this loss of DNA repair and loss of indi transportation leads to like almost identical transcriptomic profiles so they're completely overlapping here and when you knock out both you, you see a greater exacerbation of the metabolic consequences so this was really interesting and the ketogenic diet increases sphingolipid metabolism which is um, involved in myelination so this suggests that maybe we are indeed doing something about the phenotype so with Will Bohr we previously showed that um, one potential reason why you have PAR1 activation in cocaine syndrome is that uh, that PAR1 can get activated by secondary DNA structures so DNA in certain areas make a little curl on itself and then that curl will activate the DNA damage response um, and so strikingly the ketogenic diet actually reduces the stalling at these curls suggesting that you have uh, easier or you have resolution of the secondary DNA structures both in so you so this is uh, the Indy. So the Indy, if you lose citrate transportation, you get stalling at secondary DNA structures. I think that's the first thing that's really interesting. The ketogenic diet rescues that to some extent. In Cockane syndrome, you also see stalling. The structure is here. This is the coverage. And when you have the, the double, you see stalling, and that is some, somehow rescued by the ketogenic diet. So this sort of links metabolism with the secondary DNA structure resolution, which is a really uh, fascinating and uh, this is the model going briefly into it that that um, uh, ketones increase acetyl-CoA and then that leads to increased histone acetylation around secondary DNA structures so the chromatin loosens up allowing transcription to run through it and allowing the secondary structure to be resolved so this could be contributing to the sort of neuroprotective effect that you see in, in Cockney syndrome and Obviously, we also need to have the H tags here, where Eric Verdin has shown that ketones also inhibit H tags, right? And so this um, this allows the resolution of secondary DNA structures and then the shutdown of the DNA damage response. All right. So DNA repair is important in aging. This is uh, the take-home message, and I'm just going to leave. No. Um, so. Uh, we had this idea a while ago um, that we were thinking how can we stimulate DNA repair uh, and um, I've also shown this slide many times so please forgive me but uh, um, we, um, we turn to Nietzsche as you always do when you are faced with existential problems so we are thinking what does not kill me makes me stronger this is what he said in 89 <clears throat> I think 
You know, Nietzsche was interesting. He was a professor at Basel at the age of 25, just to, to put things in context. Um, so this also works for cells. So if you stress a cell and you don't kill it, you make it stronger. This is called the hormetic response. And we were thinking that perhaps we can exploit the hormetic response to facilitate DNA repair, stimulate DNA repair. So the idea is basically, if we can identify drugs that mimic the, the DNA repair response, um, but without inducing DNA damage. So tricking cells into thinking that there's DNA damage. Uh, and we did this with this gentleman that sits in the front, uh, Dr. Shavrankov, uh, and his team at Silico Medicine. They screened a lot of drugs using their platform uh, for, for drugs that could stimulate DNA repair. And then Gary Makaratichan took over this, um, this uh, development um, and in our lab tried to develop the drugs further. Um, and so we screened a large number of drugs. We took the top hits and one of the first experiments we did was to investigate if pre-treatment of cells with these compounds can protect them from DNA damage. So we pre-treated cells, so each dot here is a separate drug. We pre-treated the cells and then we look at survival over time. And there's a number of these uh, compounds here that make the cells completely resistant to a really large dose of ionizing radiation. So this was encouraging. Um, we wanted to also understand if then they, they, can, they can do something about the cellular phenotypes of aging. So this is sort of, we're sidestepping a little bit. We're taking a detour to another project, um, which is done by Indra Heckenbach in uh, Eric Verdon's uh, lab. He's been, uh, Eric has been very kind to house him there. And we, um, we developed a neural network that can predict senescent based on the nuclear shape. And what's really interesting is that it's really accurate. So it's, uh, it has a really uh, high accuracy, uh, both on repetitive senescence and ionizing radiation to senescence. So the AUC is crazy. Um, what we wanted to do also was we wanted to, to be able to use it more generally, which mean, meant that we had to avoid nuclear size differences, for example. Some cells have larger nuclei, some have smaller, so we normalized it, size normalized it. We also remove the background, of course, around the nuclei. Uh, and then, in the end, we mask them. So we only look at the shape, actually. And the reason we do that is also because we wanted to use different dyes, we, we wanted to avoid uh, artifacts of dye intensity and things like that. And this works really well. So in fibroblasts, we can see in, in various premature aging diseases, you have a high degree of senescence. If you irradiate astrocytes, you get an increase in senescence by the predictor. predictor. You can also use it in neurons. And because it's based on solely on nuclear shapes, it's very easy to transition into tissue slides. So here we have a neural network that can recognize nuclei in H. Nesting slides. And then you can see that this is in, uh, in mice. With age, you get uh, changes in the aspect ratio. So with age, the nuclei become more elongated. And we see that actually in all, um, in all of the areas we've investigated. And you get more uh, senescence um, with age. We can also go into humans. So this is a study with 200 tissue samples from people. Um, again, we train the neural network to recognize nuclei, and then we can predict senescence. <coughs> and what's very interesting here is that, um, and this just came out a few weeks ago, is that uh, if you have, so each dot here is a separate person, right? If you're a person up here, uh, you would think that this is really bad. These guys have a huge amount of senescence. What's interesting is that um, those people up here, that have more senescence have much less um, cancer, actually, than the people down here. So the propensity to be able to induce senescence for a person seem to protect that person from progression to cancer. So this, I think, is a good evidence that 
senescence is a barrier to cancer development. Okay, let's transition back to uh, our drug development. So um, we can see that with, when we treat with drug F, you reduce senescence in uh, primary fibroblasts. And uh, when you release them from, from the drug, then eventually they go back and become senescent again. And what's really remarkable when you think about uh, persistent DNA damage, Fabricio, this is, this is for you. We have persistent DNA damage foci, and when you treat the drug F, you actually reduce the amount of persistent DNA damage foci. So this is uh, almost a magical result. I uh, was very um, astounded that, that you see this. So this is, you radiate, you wait seven days, the, the cells develop persistent foci, and then you treat, and then you wait, and then the foci magically disappears. Um, in flies, when we treat with drug F, when you're a young fly, you walk like this. When you're old, you walk less. When you're on drug F, you walk a lot, even if you're old. So you sort of maintain motor function in flies with age. You also reduce DNA damage in, in some of these primary DNA repair disorders where it's previously been shown that there's more DNA damage. And you extend the lifespan in wild type flies and in, in a model of ataxia to Langetasia, um, where the flies are slightly short-lived. <coughs> Uh, we've actually identified the hit. I'm not going to um, go into what that hit is, but we have identified the hit of this drug using what's called a darts assay. Um, and uh, we've actually generated analogs, and the analogs were really necessary to be able to go into mouse models because we knew the primary target of the compound F, and that primary target was very uh, detrimental to going into animal models. We made analogs and found analogs where we are avoiding the primary target and actually getting the target that hits the DNA repair response and the aging response. So now we are really poised, I think, to uh, go into animal models and uh, further drug development. So this is super exciting. So um, I think this approach is interesting. We've, we've done it using uh, this ionizing radiation data set. We also have a UV data set and an oxidative stress data set, which will be different types of DNA damage uh, that you can then train your molecules on. Uh, so this is a, an exciting development. And hopefully, if we're thinking about spinning this out into a company, and Garrick, I don't know if he's here. Um, he, uh, Ivan is here. Yeah. Um, we, um, we're very interested in, I think, pursuing this potentially in a spin-out company. So with that, I'm, I'm just going to stop and, uh, and thank our funders and uh, our collaborators. And this is the group. We just had a lab retreat in Portugal, which was really nice. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. So you had some slides about uh, correlation uh, of senescent cell percentage with age, and uh, it was very low for human, I think 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, uh, and way, way higher for mice. So does, does it mean that for mice uh, uh, they accumulate uh, senescent cells faster, or I just misinterpreted uh, the slides? The you, you think about correlation or percent? Well, uh, Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is a... So this is in skin. So I think that there are probably more senescent cells in skin than there are in liver. I think this is published. We're calibrating the predictor based on published data set on the... On the, ah, on the uh, it is to some extent tissue specific and actually in general astrocytes or neurons seem to be in general predicted to be a little bit more senescent. So there is definitely tissue specificity. So this is something that you have to think about when using this predictor. Uh, but this is a good point. You mentioned that uh, ketone will affect the secondary structure of DNA, so uh, which facilitates transcription. Yeah, uh, so is this generally applied to 
all genes or just some specific genes? This is the first question. And then, do you know other metabolites that also facilitate transcription by affecting DNA secondary structure? Um, so, I, th I think, so we looked into G4 structures, so secondary DNA structures within genes. So these would be blocks for transcription. Um, when we do this, you, you get a large amount of variation. So it's very difficult for us to look at specific genes. You could do other types of sequencing. This is based uh, simply on the whole bulk RNA sequencing. Um, so you can do other types of sequencing. We haven't looked at that if there are specific genes. But G4s are, are scattered all across our, our genome. Um, so, so we still need to look into the gene specificity. Um, in regards to metabolites, other metabolites, I mean, I think that uh, any metabolite that can be used as a, um, that will loosen chromatin, so there's also beta hydroxy or butyration of, uh, of uh, histones that will probably loosen up chromatin, which will allow transcription through uh, the area more easily. And this will then lower sort of the baseline DNA damage that's ongoing or DNA damage response that's ongoing. Thank you. Let's, let's do one more question, okay, please. Okay. I, I saw the question there. Okay. We don't have time. Alex, you need to be hey, tougher well, on these speakers that go over time. When you are doing it, it's so I have time. a question in relation to your Venn diagram. Uh, uh -huh. Do you, what time points are you selecting and do you know how many genes are shared in the most central spot of this Venn diagram? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're training on, I think we had 400 data set in the IR. Uh, and um, we're also thinking about the overlap in the sensor, but I think that the DNA damage response varies depending on the type of damage. There are probably some central regulators where, where you could think about drugs that would stimulate all types of uh, DNA repair. Um, but I wonder if, if, um, if this will be feasible. Uh, I think that it, it may, we may need to be more focused. But I, I mean, it's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you, Morton. Big round of applause.